and, of course, working here as well for the Duke of Newcastle, also in the 1730s. Really, really key decade. Uh, that's what's left of Isha Place. Do any of you live in those houses around there? No? Some of you? There are very sort of executive houses around there, aren't they? Rather lovely. Uh, but, of course, you're living on what would have been. Some of you are smiling. You do live there, don't you? Goodness me, I haven't said anything naughty about it. I almost said something then, but I didn't. Um, this is how you create a Arcadian garden from a formal garden. This is actually quite a fun bit. I don't know whether we're going to manage to get this on YouTube. Yeah? Okay. Concentrate. Are you with me? Right. Let's look at the top one, because this is... No, no, no. Where's Jeremy? What's the time? Five past. So we've done 35 minutes. Right, okay. Are you with me? Are you, can you, yep. Right. Now I've got to have my back to you because I've got to see what I'm, what I'm up to. On the top is Isha Pre Kent 1708. Uh, there is the, it's the mole, isn't it? Yeah, it's me. It's the mole. Yeah. There it is. Can you see it? There's the Waynefleet's Tower, which of course is the Tudor Tower that was the core of the house. And can you see it's formal gardens all around it with walls? And there are banqueting pavilions, and there is a canal. Can you see it's a rectangular canal? And there's an orchard there, and there are tree lines here. And then that is just a scrubby piece of orchard, and that's the main road. And then big avenue, big avenue. This is interesting. It's a raised bowling green lined with trees. Now, have you all got that? Yes? I'll come over here. You got it? Okay, so what does Kent do? This is the Roke, after Kent's been at it. We still have the big long axis, but suddenly you opening up the house to the axis by a hippodrome, which of course we see at Chiswick as well. One of these hippodromes is very much based on Robert Castell's Villas of the Ancient that came out in 1728 when he wrote about Pliny's Villas and said that a hippodrome is one of the features that you have. Uh, again, totally spurious and fictitious, but it's Burlington again. He's a wretch. There's your house. And what he's done here is that he's opened up the view of the house to the river by taking away all the walls, all the banqueting pavilions, and just giving it grass. He's letting it breathe. Okay? Then he keeps the kitchen garden, which is there, so you keep it. But then he loses the orchard completely, Again, opening it up, and then he makes the rectangular canal trapezoid to change it, to make it more various, to make it more interesting. And at the head of it, of course, puts a temple, and that's the one you've just been seeing, Henry Pelham with Thomas Roberts, looking back to the side of the house. But this is the exciting bit. There, it was an orchard, possibly, certainly a scrubby bit of ground. He is now starting to put wiggling, winding, what Batty Langley calls arty natural paths. And if you look carefully, that is what's left of the road. Yep. And the road, of course, has been taken away from the front of the house. And in this area, he puts garden buildings. Also, he puts around this area a fosse with bastions so that you can look out into the landscape so that the livestock don't come in. And then, if we look very, very carefully, you're looking for the bowling green, and the bowling green has gone, although, of course, it's revetment still there, and he's putting uh, clump trees. And that's how you soften and loosen nature's tresses. One could do a whole lecture about women and sexuality and garden writing in the 18th century. It's all about caressing nature, nature's tresses. Uh, and that's what he does. It's a loosening of the formalities. It's not a losing of the formalities. It's a loosening of the formalities. Okay? And that's what he does at Isha. And, of course, this is what he does all over the place. Because, generally, Kent doesn't do a new landscape. He just goes where people are being... Thank you, Jeremy. Particularly Bridgman, and softens what they've done. And this, of course, is what you get at Isha. You get this great Gothic house with a rotunda or belvedere behind it on the hill and uh, a Chinese, sort of almost Chinese Chippendale bridge 
and this lovely lake, which is much more informal now. Um, the little wings to the house have canted bays so that you can look at all different aspects of the scene. You're bringing the house out into the nat natural amphitheater. And then you have Horace Walpole going there and talking about this brilliant picnic he had. And I have to read it to you because it is so fantastic. This is one of the best descriptions of having a good night out in the 18th century you ever come across. We had a magnificent dinner cloaked in the modesty of earthenware. French horns and hoped boys on the lawn. We walked to the Belvedere on the summit of the hill, where a threatened storm only served to heighten the beauty of the landscape. A rainbow on a dark cloud falling precisely behind the tower of a neighboring church. From thence we passed into the wood, and the ladies formed a circle on the chairs before the mouth of the cave, which was overhung to a vast height with woodbines, lilacs, and laburnums, and dignified by those tall, shapely cypresses. On the descent of the hill were placed the French horns, the Abigails, servants, and neighbors wandering below by the river. In short, it was Parnassus, as Vatto would have painted it. Brilliant, isn't it? Brilliant evocation. Do you know what time he got back home? Half past three. They had supper at midnight. Supper. My goodness, clubbing. I can't tell you. And Walpole actually danced. Can you believe Walpole danced, sort of mincing around? Extraordinary. Um, that's Isha, where some of you now live. And of course, Isha was a very eclectic landscape. It didn't just have garden buildings and classical temples. Um, it had thatched houses, as you can see, very much like Merlin's Cave. Um, and there were designs for Chinese buildings. It's Kent wanting us to enjoy the variety and eclectic styles of the period. And you get this in all his buildings. His buildings are very interesting because they were always highly textured. He's very, very interested in doing different types of materials for, for his buildings. Here, of course, we have the Pebble Alcove at Stowe. Templar quam delecta, how delightful, how beautiful are thy temples, and they happen to be the temple family. Um, and so he does a pebble alcove, and in the middle of it, in the pediment, he does a pebble. That's a big pebble. I mean, that's absolutely typical of Kent. And it's a riot of, of detail. It's been restored, but of course it's good. And it's three different types of stone and three different types of treatment of stone. Um, the Hermitage has Pan's pipes on the right, as you can see, and then the Congreve monument with the, uh, this monument to this great dramatist of the monkey looking in the mirror, um, which is very much a, um, a leitmotif of, of drama. He's wonderfully inventive, it's Kent. Um, he must have been fantastic uh, before he got absolutely sozzled uh, as, a, as a drinking and dinner companion. Now, what happens at Claremont is, in a sense, very similar to what happened at Isha. Here you have this vast formal landscape for the original house. Remember, Vambra owned it originally. It was called Chargate, and then became Claremont when the Earl of Clare had it. Um, and then we have great formal axes and avenues going across the front of the house. And then behind the house, you get the spine garden on the ridge. And the spine garden originally laid out by Vambra, um, and then with work later on by Bridgman. And you can see that circular pool on the top left. So all axial, um, all fairly formal, that great big long sweep along the ridge with the Belvedere behind the house that Vambra does. Then, of course, after it's sold, we then in the 1730s get Kent coming along for the Duke of Newcastle, as he then became. And he starts to actually do interesting things. He retains some of the formality, as you can see here, from the Belvedere and that great big um, axial line to the bowling green, um, and then starts to add garden buildings to those areas and then softens other areas. That's the Rigo. Can you see the Rigo? I can't actually see it from here. Is it all right? It's not brilliant, is it? But you can see that there's the temple, which is gone, and it's exactly the same view uh, as we had today. These views are very important for um, restoration. Um, the Paynes Hill people are, are brilliant at this, and, and so are the Claremont people. I wish Chiswick was. I mean, this idea of having the um, hedges too high. They're always too high. You know, you've got a herm, and you've got head and shoulders on the herm, and you're meant to have the hedge about here, so you can see the head and shoulders. 
so that when you walk around the side and you're walking through the garden and you look behind you, you can see the head and shoulders over the hedge. You go to Chiswick, the hedges are all like this big. You can't see anything. I don't know whether it's better now. Hopefully it is. I haven't been there since they've done the work. But then I got so annoyed about them putting that marquee there. Um, so here is the rogue engraving showing the softening of that original landscape by Bridgman um, and Vambra. And as you can see, all around the rogue engraving, you have the garden buildings. Now, very interesting in, at Claremont, almost all of them are classical. And, you know, um, adaptations and modifications on sort of Palladian uh, designs. Um, the one down the very bottom, David, what's it called? I can't remember what you said it was called now. Is it called the White House? The White House? There it is. There it is. On the Roke engraving. See? Which we've got surviving. Almost all the other ones, um, well, some of the other ones have gone. Um, and I don't need to, again, go through the Isha comparison I've just been with you, but you can see at the front of the house, we've lost one of the great formal axes. We've got clumps of trees instead. There are a lot more artinatural winding paths along that spine. We've lost that round, round geometric pond, and suddenly we've now got a lake, uh, and then the amphitheater looks down to the lake. Now, the amphitheater is definitely a Bridgman feature, but the lake and the softening of the lake I'm sure, is part of Kent trying to loosen the straps. Think of Palladianism as a straitjacket. And Kent is in this straitjacket. And garden design is in this straitjacket. And it's got to be loosened out. And that's what Kent does. So there's the amphitheater on the right. Um, and there is Kent's temple in the middle of the lake. Um, and, of course, the cascade, as you can see, on the left. The amphitheater is interesting because uh, I personally think that these amphitheaters that uh, Bridgman was interested in doing um, were for theatricals um, and for displaying plants and for sitting in, and I'm, I'm sure de they derive straight from the Bobbly Gardens because that's the first thing you see when you go to Florence. Um, as with all my students, the first thing we see is the Bobbly. Uh, and these lovely paintings that were commissioned around about 1750, um, John Harris. Um, you know, the most lovable rogue in the world. Um, John and I go back a long way. Uh, he called this particular artist, who's anonymous, the master of the tumbling chairs. And you can see that almost all of them have got tumbling chairs. Can you see how many chairs there are, though? And that's what these gardens were for. They were meant to be uh, sat in. And then you get the perfection of it all. And this is Kent.